Thank you for another time together as is the body of Christ, eating together, sharing together, um, talking family and church and politics and all of the things that, that are kind of surround us in life. Thank you for the privilege that it is to, to do this with those who have been purchased by Christ uh, with us. So, Lord, I, I pray that as we look to your word to get a better understanding of what the Lord's Supper is, as we continue to uh, have our lives and our church shaped by your word, uh, give us wisdom, give us understanding, and, and Lord, I pray for a good conversation that, uh, that we can all learn from each other tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Well, our goal last month, I know it's been a long time, I, I <clears throat> didn't, didn't realize that I would also forget everything that we taught. So uh, just to review a little bit, last month we had one goal, and the goal last month was to um, see from scriptures that the early church was observing the Lord's Supper. And some, it's one of those things that we take for granted, uh, like of course they were, because because we do it, right? But it's not always the case. Sometimes we're doing something that the early church wasn't doing. Sometimes the early church is doing something that we're not doing. So we, our goal last month was to establish from Scripture that the participation in the Lord's Supper was a regular observance of the early church. And we saw that happening in the book of Acts, and we saw it in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and the reason we looked at Acts and 1 Corinthians was because Jesus— uh, we, we, we examined, if you remember, we walked through the Gospels a little bit, and we saw Jesus talking about the Lord's Supper. We saw the Last Supper, uh, but it wasn't explicit that we should be doing the Lord's Supper um, and not something like foot washing, for instance, right? So if you remember that conversation, Jesus seems to tell the disciples, you should wash each other's feet now whenever you get together. Uh, and it's hard to tell whether or not he was actually commanding that. And so in order to discern whether he was commanding that, we looked to the early church. Was the early church doing that? No, they weren't. Uh, and, and seeing that the early church was not doing it, you don't see it in any of Paul's letters. You don't see it referenced in the book of Acts. And you realize, okay, maybe Jesus had another point to that. But the Lord's Supper is practiced in Acts and uh, in the Corinthian church especially. Um, so this month, now that we've established that the Corinthian church, at, at the very least, and plus several of the other churches, were observing the Lord's Supper, we're going to look more to what the meaning of the Supper is and the significance of it for us. To do this, uh, we're going to stay right where we were in 1 Corinthians, and uh, we're going to start working our way backwards towards the Gospels. Um, why might we, uh, kind of on this subject, why might it be better to move backwards? rather than from the Gospels forward. What's that? Okay, yep. <laughs> Dyslexic, or you, you read Hebrew, you read or, uh, Arabic, you like to go right to left? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. there is some relief, like back, what I'm um, kind of thinking, the reason I want to do it, or did you have something, Jose? Uh, I think a lot of the stuff after the Gospels is just like the interpretation of what the Exactly, Gospels. that's... Boom. That's what I'm looking for. That's how I'm thinking. Uh, so you have Jesus who is interpreting the Old Testament in light of himself, showing everyone that because of all, everything the Old Testament is, is prophesying and, and, and describing, is moving towards the Christ who is Jesus. And then you have all of the descriptions from the, epistle, the apostles afterwards saying, hey, all this stuff that Jesus said, let me explain that for you because I know it's a little bit complicated. And so that's basically what we get with the epistles. Uh, so I use the, the, the scriptures as a commentary on the scriptures, as, or as Jose put it, let the scriptures interpret scriptures. So 1 Corinthians is a great example of this. Uh, it's a commentary on Jesus' teachings in some ways. Uh, and it, it also, so you've got the, 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 the scriptures themselves, the epistles written by apostles, our uh, commentaries on Jesus' teachings, and then the early church's practices are sort of the application of those teachings. So when you combine both of those together, it really helps us to understand the Gospels. Uh, so we'll begin in 1 Corinthians and move backwards towards the Gospels. We'll probably um, only get to 1 Corinthians 10 tonight, 
um, but it's all it's prepared for. Uh, so if we go anywhere else, it'll be you know, flying blind. So uh, let's read. Um, we read we read First Corinthians ten last month, and we saw there that Paul was had used the the, the church's practice of the Lord's Supper to to, to make a point to the church. Uh, but our interest then uh, last month was just the fact that they were eating the Lord's Supper. That's all we wanted to establish. It's very very low bar. Now we're going to look more about what he was teaching with that. So can uh, we're going to read First Corinthians chapter ten verses one through twenty two. If uh, and we'll break it up so we can get some various readers here. So if if you're watching the recording of this, we're going to read First Corinthians ten verses one through twenty two. You may not be able to hear everyone who is reading for you. So read your scriptures on your own. Uh, uh, can I get a reader for ten verses one through five? Terry. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown. And how about 6 through 13, next paragraph. Thank you. Uh, 12 and 13 as well. Thank you. And then finally, verses 14 through 22. One more reader. All right, thank you. Well, what's going on here in chapter 10? What is this section about? Just what are you seeing? Is it about the Lord's Supper? If you were to like just summarize it in a in a few words, would you say, oh, this is totally about how we eat the Lord's Supper? Okay, good, good. What what is um do you see any direct commands here? Flee from idolatry. Okay. So when you see in scripture a direct command like that, it's a good hint that this probably well, first of all, you get a therefore statement. And a therefore statement is you it should be for someone attempting to interpret the scriptures, a big flashing red sign, hey, look right here, look at me, look at this passage. There's a big point happening. So the point here is to flee from idolatry. Who's, who's Paul writing to? Who's he speaking to? Paul. 
He's the, talking to the Corinthian church. Now, what, what, what's happening right here is he is, uh, we are jumping into the middle of one of Paul's arguments in 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians is written to uh, the church in Corinth. They have uh, several issues that they have written Paul about, and he is responding to some of their questions. He's also um, chastising them for some of their problems. So he begins the book by focusing on some of the issues that have uh, come up within the church that have, that have caused problems, and then he begins to respond to their questions. And when he's responding to one of their questions, he'll say something like, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And you see that in chapter 7. Uh, so now concerning about the matters about which you wrote. And the, and the church was curious about, well, should, should we be getting married or should we stay single? Uh, and how do we think about marriage? So in chapter 7, he addresses some of those questions and answers them for, him, for them. And then in chapter 8, there's a question concerning food offered to idols. So look at the very beginning of chapter 8. It says, now concerning food offered to idols. And so as you follow that argument, you realize that when we get to chapter 10, we're still in the food offered to idols section, technically. Uh, and, and so we're, we haven't gotten on to Paul's actual discussion about the Lord's Supper and head coverings and those sorts of things later on, uh, chapter 10, chapter 11. So um, chapter 10 is in the context of the question about food offered to idols which we began in chapter 8, and what he's saying there is that even though, so if we go back to chapter 8, he's saying in chapter 8, even though food sacrificed to idols isn't really worshiping another god per se, um, so if, if you went to the market in town, you got some meat, uh, and you, you brought it home, and you cook it up at home, you're not worshiping uh, another god by doing that. Um, but if you go to the temple, and you get the meat that has been sacrificed to one of the gods, that, that's another issue. And so he's, he's helping the church discern between these issues of when you knowingly buy food sacrificed to idols, when you eat food sacrificed to idols, but you didn't know it when you ate it, are you going to hell for that? Like there's all these questions that the church has. He's helping them to sort it out. There's some people in the church who are um, saying, hey, I know that this meat was sacrificed to Hermes or Zeus or whoever, but that's not really a god, and so it's okay for me to eat this. Uh, I, it's my right to eat this food. And so Paul goes on then in chapter 9 to talk about rights. Okay, well, let's talk about your rights. Let's talk about my right as an apostle. My right as an apostle, Paul says, is, is to be supported by the local church to preach the gospel to you. And, and then he kind of reminds them, and I'm not charging you anything. Uh, I have the right to charge you. That I have the right to receive from you uh, food and housing and benefits for what I'm doing here as, uh, as your teacher, as an apostle, but I'm not because that would distract from my proclamation of the word because of some of the issues that you have as a church. So he says, for the sake of Christ, I'm setting aside my rights for the sake of Christ, what he's going to get at is you should also set aside your rights. Now, where does this, how does this get us to um, this issue that we're seeing in chapter 10? Well, in chapter 10, what he's saying is, I have set aside my rights because my main focus is on glorifying Christ, and I don't want to be so uh, distracted by all these other things that can take me away from my mission that I become disqualified as a minister of the gospel, which raises a question, well, can you be disqualified as a minister of the gospel? And that's where chapter 10 gets in, is he says, yeah, you, you can be disqualified as a minister of the gospel. You can be disqualified as a church member, even. Uh, and and that's, that's where he's going to begin to bring in some of these uh, similarities between the church and Israel. <laughs> a lot of competition in there. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are funny. Um, all right. Um, let's see, where was I here? All right, so um, looking at, at chapter 10, uh, when he says, well, how do we know someone can become disqualified even though he belongs to the church? What is his argument here? So you, you're, you're 
You're a church member. You do churchy stuff. So did Israel, exactly. So he's going to say, all right, you church member, you think you've got it all together. You, you've been baptized. You take the Lord's Supper. You participate in the regular meetings of the church. That does not mean that you are uh, going to make it to the promised land, as it were. Uh, because let's look back at Israel. Most of Israel, look at, look at that in, uh, in verse 5. With most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So not just like a handful of Israelites didn't make it to the promised land. Most of them didn't make it into the promised land. And then in, 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 he's drawing an analogy. Israel, in many ways, is very similar to the church. Therefore, if an Israelite could be left behind or, or disqualified, then so can a church member. Now, Paul is not saying, Paul's not teaching here that someone who was born again can lose their salvation. He's not saying that. What he's saying is that just as in Israel, there were some who were with the Israelites who were not truly elect Israel, there are some of those who gather with the church who do not truly belong to Christ. So as, as John would say in, his, in 1 John, they went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. So same, same sort of concept happening there, same issue here. Now the question is, is whether or not Israel is a good analogy to the church. All right, and so Paul wants to strengthen that relationship because we would think, oh no, Israel's very different than the church because you know we have we have Christ and they didn't have Christ. So they're so far different, so far apart that we can't really draw analogies between what happened to them in the wilderness and what happens to us in our churches. And he says, not so fast, right? They they had they had the presence of God. And what was the presence of God with Israel? The cloud. Yeah, he, he speaks of the cloud, um, the cloud by day, which helped shade them. And then you have the, the fire by night, which helped light the way. So you have the cloud. The cloud is the presence of God. It, it, this cloud is the, the manifestation of the Spirit, as it were. What else did Israel have? They had the rock, which is relates to what? So this is the rock, which is Christ, which relates to they're drinking uh, the water from the rock, drinking a spiritual drink, which the analogy to the church would be, uh, I, I think, the wine at the supper. Uh, so you, they have a spiritual food and a spiritual drink. Their spiritual food was the manna from heaven. Their spiritual drink was water from the rock. The church has the spiritual food of the, the bread at the Lord's Supper, and the cup at the Lord's Supper. So he's saying, look, uh, they also had, there's one more element that Paul mentions here. Baptism, right. So what was Israel's baptism? The Red Sea. And this is, this is, this is pretty neat, having just come out of Noah's Ark together. So uh, they had the presence of God, and they had baptism. The cloud was the presence of God. Baptism was the Red Sea crossing. Now, how was this baptism? It was similar to Noah's Ark. God made a way through the waters of judgment for those who were with Noah on the ark. God made a way through the waters of judgment for those who were with Moses on the dry land. They went through the, the sea that judged Egypt, right? So Pharaoh and all the Egyptians were judged in that. It was death for them, but it was life for those who were in Moses, and Paul uses the, the language, they were baptized into Moses, uh, which is interesting. But this is, a simple, it, this is essentially what baptism is. This is, how, this is Paul's theology of baptism. It's, it's ours as well. It's identification with the one who takes us through judgment. And so it's a public identification with the one who takes us through judgment. So the presence of God is, is similar. Uh, but it's more complete in the church. Baptism is similar, but it's more complete in the church. They had the spiritual food and the drink. Um, and, and so in, in a moment, we're going we're gonna to look at this, how this manna from heaven is and, and the water are, are fulfilled in the Lord's Supper. Um, the big question of how that works. But before we do, I want to continue with Paul's argument. Um, Paul's point is that though all of Israel had all of these external signs – 
of being God's people, and they had Christ with them, as, as he says, Christ was the rock. Uh, some of them, most of them, in fact, were not truly Israel, and they were overthrown in the wilderness. Um, and this, this, we see this, uh, I mentioned the first John passage, but we also see in, um, is it Romans 9, Romans 9, 6, Paul mentions that not all Israel are Israel. So it's, uh, it's not as though the word of God is failed, he says, for not all who are descended from Israel, not everyone who is born of Jacob is actually true Israel. And you, you, you know the remnant language that you have in the Old Testament? Say, that's, that's the subject that, that he's speaking of it up here. So before we go one step further, though, um, with Israel having a, uh, a, a type of baptism in the Lord's Supper and the presence of Christ, in a way, um, and Paul's pointing this forward to baptism in the Lord's Supper for us, what does this tell us about the, the power and the effectiveness of baptism in the Lord's Supper? Do you understand the question? Okay. Um, so they had something that was like baptism in the Lord's Supper, and they fell away. They were ultimately not saved. We have baptism in the Lord's Supper, and Paul's major point here is we can fall away. Uh, so the question is, are baptism and the Lord's Supper salvific? Can they save you? No. Do you see how that's the case in the text, that they cannot save you? All right. So one of the main points here is that going under the waters of baptism and then eating the bread and drinking the cup uh, won't save us. That's, that's Paul's point. You've, you've got these things, and yet you're still at risk of, of, of falling away. These are not the things that save, save you. Um, we'll see more of what they are, but it's clear that they are not instruments of salvation. If they were, then here's how the argument would go. Paul would have said, because all of Israel went through the water, the sea, and all of Israel ate the manna, and of all of Israel ate from the drink the water from the rock, therefore they all went into the promised land. Right? That would have been the argument. They had the, the external elements, the external signs, therefore they were saved into the land. But that's actually the opposite of the argument, isn't it? His point is, they don't save, they're significant, but they, they, they don't save. Most of them were overthrown even though they had the baptism in the Lord's Supper. So our confidence thus as, as Christians is not in our baptism. Our confidence is not in the Lord's Supper because they do not save us. They, they, they signify something. They aren't nothing, though. That's, that's another important point here is um, Paul's speaking of them with, with high regard. They, uh, they don't save us, but they aren't nothing. His, his point is not the Lord's Supper and baptism don't save you, therefore they're worthless, let's stop doing them, right? We continue to do these things, and it's not just because Jesus said to do them. Uh, they, there is significance in what Jesus has taught us. He was not not making a, an arbitrary command or um, just a, uh, they're not, it's not a test. These are good commands that, that Christ has given us. So um, his point is, they don't save you, but they are significant. We should heed their significance. Um, and then he says, uh, basically, don't be like Israel. That's, that's kind of the point here. <laughs> right? So they, they, they had the presence of God. Uh, they, were, they were baptized. They were being fed by God. They had, uh, they had Christ, the rock. Uh, and then they became idolaters and grumblers. And he goes on and basically lists all of their sins from the book of Numbers, or well, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, and then, to, to, to kind of bring the point home, and don't think you're better than Israel. That's, that's really where the, where, the, where the switch is, isn't it? Don't think you're better than Israel because you belong to the church and nothing can happen to you. And that's exactly what verse 12 is about. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And then brings it home, flee from idolatry. Any questions so far? <laughs>
about where, where we're at, where we're headed? Any clarification, points of clarification? All right, do you see the argument so far? The, the big idea here is he, he's trying to just help them understand whether or not they should eat food sacrificed to idols and how they are to love one another as a church. And also, idolatry is a bad thing. It's taken God's people before. All right, we're we moving on now. All right, so let's, let's get on to um, what's next. Um, he, he's going to, I'm going to skip ahead towards the, towards the end there uh, uh, before we come back to a little bit more about the Lord's Supper. Um, flee from idolatry is the driving point. The context is, is, is with regards to eating meat sacrificed to idols. He's saying that knowingly, uh, I'm going to kind of give you his, his main argument there. Knowingly eating meat sacrificed to idols is wrong because it is participation, it is partaking in the table of demons. So those who are in Christ are not to do that. Those who are in Christ eat instead where? At the Lord's table. We don't eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons. Now what, anybody want to take a stab at what he means by these are demons? False gods, right? There you go. That's it. Yeah. So, so we may think, okay, uh, Zeus is mythology, or Diana is mythology. And he's saying, well, kind of, but there's something behind it. There's a dark force behind what is deceiving these men and women into believing in these false gods, and that dark force is demons. So when you worship false gods, you are participating in it with the demons. So when we talk about Islam, for instance, we don't just say, oh, it's another religion. We understand Islam is a demonic religion. Uh, when we talk about uh, Mormonism, something that is posing as Christianity and is detaching the personhood of, of Christ from the divine, from God, this is demonic. See what I'm getting at? Yeah, this is a deception, a demonic deception. So these are, th that's Paul's point here, is when, when you guys, as the Corinthians, are doing these things, you need to understand this isn't, uh, this isn't harmless. This is, this is dangerous, and it, it is actually idolatrous and demonic. Um, so it's just not a, um, it's not a neutral thing. So now let's consider the significance of what we're doing when we eat the bread and drink the cup. Paul is using eating the bread and drinking the cup to teach them not to eat the bread and drink the cup of idols. But we're seeing here language we haven't seen yet as Christians regarding the bread and the cup, and so it's informative for us. Uh, so we're, we're uh, eavesdropping on a conversation. It reminds me of like, uh, you know, uh, kids, little kids, eavesdropping on mom and dad who are talking in the kitchen or the dining room or living room or something. And there's something they didn't understand. Mom and dad are talking about, you know, the budget. And the kids are hearing them talk uh, about, you know, Christmas. And they now they get to find out what their Christmas presents are because they, they eavesdropped in on there. We're kind of seeing that same sort of thing. The conversation is not about the Lord's Supper. It's about idolatry. But we get to learn more about the Lord's Supper because we're the little kids who just don't know a whole lot about this stuff. And so we're, 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 we're gleaning. From this conversation, my assumption is the, the Corinthian church had a very robust theology about the Lord's Supper because the way that Paul talks about it in, in 10 and 11 is with the assumption that they already know these things. Of course, you guys know this. Now, based on that knowledge, you know, don't eat food sacrificed to idols. And we're like, I didn't know the first part. So anyway, so let's look at verse 16 because this is the big one. All of that build up to verse 16. When, when you see a word like is in the scriptures, um, it's helpful. He's going to tell us what the cup is and what the body is or what the bread is. And that, that is a definition for us as Christians. Verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Uh, I think, uh, Steve, your translation said sharing. Was that, that, that's a great translation. 
Uh, good, good translation, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. So the key word here in the ESV is participation. The cup of blessing, that word blessing, uh, is, is actually eulogy. Where have you heard the word eulogy before? At a funeral? Right. What is, what is a eulogy? It's a good word. Yeah, so that's what, it, this is, this is the, the cup of, of blessing, and, and we don't know exactly what he means by the cup of blessing. Our best guess is this is one of the cups of wine that was drunk at the Passover meal, and they have taken that Passover meal language and translated it into the Lord's Supper meal. So in the Passover meal, there were, I think, four or five, someone with a more Jewish background, help me out here, four or five cups of wine in the Passover meal. Anybody know? No? Four? Okay. Four? Yeah. There was a lot of wine. It was not, it wasn't John MacArthur grape juice. It was, this was, this is the real stuff. So you have a, a third, they, they, they say that the cup of blessing is either the third or the fourth cup. We don't know which one. Everybody stopped counting by that point, I guess. So there, it's the third or the fourth cup, and this is one where there would be a blessing said at the meal. Anyway, that might not even be what's going on here. It might be, just be borrowed language from somewhere else. Uh, but the key word here that we want to look at is participation. Now, if you have a King James Bible, where's, where's Diane? Oh, she's my trusty King James Okay. Uh, does anybody have a King James Bible with him? What does it say? Communion. There it is. Who did, did you say that? Thank you. All right. So it's uh, this is where you get the word communion. Why do we call it communion? First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 in the King James. And then it stuck. All right. So, so we call it communion as a church, often more than we call it the Lord's Supper, uh, because of the meaning there. Now, this, this, this word um, is, uh, you know, Paul saying this is a communion with the blood of Christ, communion with the body of Christ, uh, the Lord's Supper. We often call it communion. The Greek word is koinonia. Who's heard that word before? Koinonia. Yeah. What does it mean? Fellowship is, is the common translation. Hip churches will call their potluck meals koinonia meal, like we could have called that, that tonight. Or they might have koinonia community groups or women's koinonia night. It's, um, it, it's often translated fellowship. Um, but it really depends on the context, right? So yes, it means oftentimes fellowship, but in the context, it can mean something a little bit deeper. And so here, it's, uh, it's a little bit deeper than fellowship. It's more of a sharing, which is what I, I love how the, that's New American Standard. Is that right, Steve? So New American Standard translates it as sharing in. So you are sharing in the table together. You're sharing in the body of Christ together. You're sharing in the, the blood of Christ together. Um, we could say, really, the best way to look at it is sharing in the benefits that the table host has given us. So if you go to someone's, uh, someone who's very wealthy and they serve a big feast for you, uh, and there are all sorts of fine meats and steaks and uh, just good beverages, you're sharing in the benefits of that wealthy table host. And that's what's happening here. You are sharing in the benefits of the table host. And as we will see later on, this is the Lord's table. The benefits of his table are greater. Paul's, Paul's point here is the benefits that you know about Christians are greater than just the bread and just the cup. Right? This goes beyond. This is the body and the blood so that you, you benefit much more greatly from the body of Christ and the blood of Christ than you would from just a loaf of bread and just a, a cup of wine. So, so something significant is happening here when you're sharing in the table. Uh, then he says in verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all, part are all partake of the one bread. Now this verse seems kind of out of place, doesn't it? Look at verse 16. Now look at verse 18. Somebody tell me how verse 17 fits there. Yeah, definitely. Saunders? Yeah. 
hearts are united as one body. Uh huh. You're getting that from when you partake of the bread and eating it. You're uniting your heart to what God is doing. Good. Okay. But when we participate in we partake in the body of Christ, we're one. And there's only one bread. Yeah, there's one body of Christ. The bread is Christ, right? Are we clear on that? Bread is Christ, the body of Christ. There's only one Christ. Therefore, the one church is benefiting from the one Christ. It, it's uniting us together, which I think is important uh, because Israel in the wilderness eating the manna, there was lots of manna, lots of flaky manna. They were all fed by it as one family of God. As, as the church, when we participate in the one bread, not the many, but the one bread, we are participating in, in the body of Christ together. All right. So um, the, and the analogy is, again, looking back to Israel, saying, consider, consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. So what's going on here? So we have bread. He's moving towards his argument about idolatry. But he, he's beginning with the bread that we eat together as Christians at the table, the wine that we drink together as Christians at the table, at the Lord's table, uh, bringing us together as participating. We're benefiting from the table host. And now we've got Israelites participating in the altar. What does that mean for them? What did it mean for Israel to make a sacrifice and then eat the sacrifice? How often were they able to do that? You know, sometimes they were. Yeah, there were some offerings. These were peace offerings. Uh, a peace offering. When they made a peace offering, it was kind of like a sharing at the table with with the Lord. Um, some offerings, like the the atonement sacrifice, not so much. The peace offering, yes. And so uh, it, Leviticus is a long book, and if you're, uh, it, it, it gets a little bit um, confusing. But a peace offering, they're able to share in the meal together with the Lord in, in, in that sense. And so they are, um, are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. These people are participating in the altar. They're making a sacrifice to the Lord um, and participating in that, that meal with them. Um, now, at this point, we kind of get into this, we can go into some hairy territory um, about whether or not Christ is in the bread and the wine, right? Because w w when we talk about making a sacrifice at an altar and you've got bread at the altar, if you are a Roman Catholic, then you might think, okay, well, when we go to the altar and when we participate in the Lord's table, we're breaking Jesus, we're re-crucifying him, we're receiving the forgiveness. Is that what Paul is talking about? It, it is, yeah, and this is, why, this is where they're getting that argument from. But is that what Paul's talking about? No, we, that's right. Why? why? Why would we say, what's Paul's not... He wasn't, but he did. He did end up in Rome. Uh, <laughs> all roads. All. Any thoughts here? Why? Why is there an altar and a sacrifice in the same conversation about the bread? Or am I just confusing matters? Am I obfuscating something that should be pretty clear? Why is there a discussion? Verse eighteen about an altar and Israel and sacrifice in the same conversation about the Lord's Supper. Okay, tell me what you mean by that. Yes. That's true. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's let's slow down a minute, um, because that we need we need to kind of review when you when I get to a sticky spot like this in Scripture and my head starts to kind of bounce back and forth and get confused. It's good to go back to what we know for sure. 
So what do we know for sure already from this text? Uh, what did Paul already say was the equivalent of the bread? Or, or the, the Old Testament type that pointed to the bread? What did Israel have? The manna, right. Okay, so we're thinking, all right, manna. Uh, and what did he say was, was sort of the pointing forward to the, the spiritual drink that we have? The water from the rock. All right, so you've got, you've got the manna from heaven and water from the rock. Now think about the book of John. What does Jesus teach in the book of John? I am the bread of life and the water of life. So let's look at, let, at, um, at Jesus' teaching in the book of John for a moment to kind of reset our bearings. John chapter 6. All right, so John chapter 6, Jesus has given the... Uh, the the 5,000, some bread, he's fed them, and uh, then he walked on water. The next day, um, people are looking for more bread. Uh, they think that's what Jesus is all about. And uh, we get to verse 29. We find out Jesus is not all about just feeding people earthly bread. Can someone read verses 29 through 34 for us? John chapter 6, verse 29 through 34. Yes. Good. Uh, and can someone read 35 through 41? Okay, so Jesus is the bread of life, and how do you, and, and the bread of life is the bread of eternal life, and how does one receive eternal life through this bread? Belief, faith, right, good. Um, so th this, this, camper, this conversation goes on for a little while in John chapter 6. Um, it's, it's a little, I wouldn't, not, not convoluted, but it's very John-like. Uh, this, this is, when you read John's gospel, this is typical John's gospel. Uh, when you're looking for types in scripture, just as a, a little side clue, John lays them all right on the surface for you. All right, so when we're looking in Matthew and we're trying to piece together the bread of the presence, as we did when we when we went over the Lord's Supper in Matthew, and um, so you got the bread of the presence and the the, um, the the Passover lamb, and we're trying to piece it. John just lays it all right there for us. Look, everybody, you're dense. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the manna. Okay, you, you get all right. So when you eat the Lord's Supper, you're eating the manna, which is the bread of life. That is the main point that John's kind of driving at here. And when you're participating in the Lord's Supper. From John's perspective, or from, from the way that John describes it for us, you are eating the bread from God. Um, it, it is the provision, this is spiritual provision from God that is represented at the table for us. Um, so you have the, the bread there from, uh, that is the manna, it's an echo. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. 
Sorry, I got it. Uh, I'm trying. So, um, so in what way then does, does the bread give us life? It's 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 um, it is when it's not just believing in Jesus; it's believing what in what Jesus has accomplished. Uh, he gives us life. He's the bread of life because when he is broken as an atoning sacrifice, there's that word sacrifice for us. We trust through faith that he truly is the one from heaven. All right. So there's there is a brokenness. That must the breaking that's got to take place, and that is what has happened at the cross. Um, the atoning sacrifice then becomes effective for us. Uh, he's the rock. Similarly, going back to Paul's other, going back to First Corinthians ten, he's the rock because when before he could give the water, uh, he had to be struck by Moses. And in the way that, that the Christians for years and years have seen this is that the law, Moses, representing the law, strikes the rock, and the rock brings forth the water that is the life that allows Israel to live. Um, you remember the story about Moses and the rock? You've got to strike the rock. Why was Moses, maybe you can help me with this, Robert. <laughs> Why was Moses not allowed in the promised land? Struck the rock twice. Yeah, so the first time in Exodus, uh, he strikes the rock, the rock once, just as God had said, strike the rock, water will come forth. It happens again. People are grumbling. They still don't trust the Lord. It's in Numbers 17 or something like that, somewhere in Numbers. Uh, and in, God doesn't tell him to strike the rock. He just says, speak to it. And then he hits it twice out of frustration. Uh, and, and God's like, that's it. You're not going in. And that, again, looking back to Sunday, he, he did more than the Lord God had commanded. Uh, thinking of, of Noah, who did exactly as the Lord had commanded. Moses was doing a pretty good job up to that point. Yeah, but he was banned uh, because he did more than the Lord commanded. Uh, right. The, the rock only needed to be struck once. Christ only needed to die once for his people. And from then on out, he would continue to provide for them, which is, I think, what is being applied there. Did anything else you want to add to that? No? Saunders, any, anybody else, anything to add to that? Kind of an interesting story, but do you see how we're reading the, 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 the Old Testament now in light of Christ? Um, does it bother anybody? Um, it shouldn't, because Paul says it, the rock is Christ. So if Paul says it, he's an apostle, he's more informed than I am. And so I'm just going to learn from Paul and say, okay, well, that's how I'm going to understand Exodus. Is this just pointing forward to Christ? And there is a sense in, in which Christ is, is, is there. So the bread must be broken uh, in order for us to, to feast on it and receive the benefits. The rock must be struck in order, us, in order to give, us, give the water. And so that's kind of the, what, what Paul's pointing to there. Uh, the blood doesn't pour from Christ until he is pierced. Right, so that's that's where we're seeing that. Um, uh, one one other thing I want us to see here, as as far as our Old Testament connection, in verse twenty one, Paul calls this the table of the Lord. And we're almost done. Uh, verse twenty one says, "You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons." Now, we've already seen that manna. As a relationship to the bread, and the uh, the rock, the water has a relationship to the cup, but manna wasn't served on a table, right? <laughs> they were picking it up off the ground, uh, and, and the the water from the rock wasn't served at the table, and yet there was a table of the Lord. Where was the table of the Lord? The table of the Lord is where. Yeah, there, there's the last supper, but before that, the the. Yahweh's table. It's in the tabernacle, right? So you've got the the uh, the, the most holy place, uh, the the holy of holies, and then the the tent of meeting. And in the tent of meeting, where the Lord uh, symbolically met with uh, his people, um, the priests, you have the table. Uh, and and that table had twelve loaves of bread on it, called the bread of the presence or the show bread, and it also had flagons. Um, for, for drinking the wine. So you got bread and wine at the table of the Lord in the tabernacle in the presence of God. So this is 
very much something that, that Paul is also referencing. It's not just the manna, it's not just the water, but it's also the table of the Lord that the Lord's Supper is pointing us back to, or that was you know, probably more accurately, the table of the Lord from the tabernacle is pointing forward to the Lord's Supper. So what happens to where everyone else gets to participate, to where all, all of us get to participate in the table of the Lord? The veil is torn open, right? So the, the curtain of the temple is opened up. Now that place is not just for the, the, uh, the high priests. Now it is for all of us because all of us are now priests, all right? So, so when he talks about the table of the Lord, he's talk, talking about the tabernacle. So we've got manna, we've got showbread, we have a sacrifice, uh, and the sacrifice points us to the, the, the sacrificial lambs and, and goats and, and bulls and things like that that were ultimately fulfilled in Christ, the one true sacrifice. All right. Um, so that's, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Right. Yep. And then the Holy Holy. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. There's two, th there's two curtains. Yes. There's a curtain before the curtain of the, uh, of the table where the table room is, the meeting room is, and there's another curtain. Both, um, when, when, when the Gospels say that the curtain was torn, I think they're implying some, it's, they're implying the one, the Holy of Holies was most definitely, but there's also this sense where it's, uh, it's, what do you call it, ambiguous enough to where we're also to understand that all are participating at that table now, okay. It is definitely that, yes. So there's there's kind of a ambiguity there that is a, that is enough for us to see that it's symbolizing both things. Uh, and it's probably not helpful, but <laughs> all right. I I think that's it for tonight. From from First Corinthians chapter ten. Anybody else have any other questions? Don't need the table of demons. Uh, is is Paul's point here? But um, our big driving idea here is we're seeing some fulfillment from the Old Testament coming in and some relationship between us and Israel um, because of Christ's work. Saunders? Mm. To actually apply his teaching. Um, Aside from listening to the type of music you listen to, uh, <laughs> um, no, I can't think of it. Foods, you know, if if I were to take a stab at it, um, I would say like those who might try to have a mystical experience through um, drugs, um, crystals, certainly. Um, Yeah, yes, that. But I was thinking more of a, something you're ingesting. Um, so when I think of food, I'm thinking of someone who's going to do shrooms or something to try to have an out-of-this-world experience in order to get in touch with something else. Um, but aside from just things you're ingesting, yes, you guys have mentioned crystals, people being in the presence of crystals to try to get good energy. Um, what did you say? Horoscopes and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So some, yeah, some people kind of joke around with astrology uh, and tarot cards in a way that is, they're like, oh, I'm just playing. This isn't really serious. But Paul would say, oh, this is this is demon stuff. So. Yeah, or some would say then yoga in, in that regard, uh, depending on um, it, your approach to it. Uh, so. 
Yes. Um, well, definitely worship. I think that one's really clear. But the, what Paul's getting at here is some of these gray areas that you might not consider worship. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yes, Laura. But I think that's clear. Uh, and then there's also the other issue that he's getting at. So the two rules uh, for Christians, the two rules of conscience are, one, if you know this has been sacrificed to an idol, don't eat it. If you don't know, and you're sitting down to eat it, and you invite someone else from church over, and they see the meat, and they suspect that it might be, then you don't eat it out of respect for their weak conscience. You both don't. Yeah, you say, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and you kind of go on with your lentils. And, uh, <laughs> Susie, did you have a question or a comment? Oh. Yeah, what did Moeller say about that that you liked, Saunders? Positive affirmation. Like, because you cannot buy a vehicle, you can't ride in a Chevy, you can't ride in a Ford, you or a Volkswagen, like just or Toyota. You can't do anything that is is not been promoting the, the that agenda. So um, the left, the the rainbow flag agenda. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because there, there was a baseball player, wasn't it? There was a there was a ball player for the Tam Tampa Bay Rays, yeah, who was like, no, I'm not going to wear the rainbow uniform um, to to the game, and so I don't remember. I think they let him wear a regular uniform, or he's at the bench or something. Uh, but that that was positive affirmation of that agenda. Whereas I think a lot of what we're doing is is really just it's so endemic to our culture. Um, I mean, my personal, you know, I I try not to buy from companies that make it a, make it a big deal, but all of the companies are making it a big deal. I mean, so there are companies who are sending their, um, you know, who say, okay, if we live in Texas and you it's illegal to get an abortion in Texas, well then we will pay for your plane trip to California. Well, like you, that's every company. So like if I if I were to say well I'm not going to support the companies that are doing that at first I was like that and then I realized well I, that's everybody they're all doing that now because it's a lot cheaper than for them to pay for that than it is for their health healthcare and to to have to have the baby so it's a dollars and cents thing for the companies but it's um it's, it's a good question though Susan how how we have to make those decisions I think more and more as Christians we're going to be forced it's going to be a little bit harder um, than it is even now. Russ? Right, yeah. So, uh, well, don't pay your taxes then. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You, you tell them, Dustin told you that you didn't have to. <laughs> uh, the VA? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Man, this is hard to get away from. Uh, Jose. Uh, so, because we're talking about citizenship, it's a related question. Uh, does, like, being a gluttony make you the idol and feel superior in that, or is that a separate sin from, like, participation? Because hmm. now, like, actions do fall out. <laughs> yeah. And either way, I know it's wrong either way, but I'm saying. Would it no, I think it is related. Because Paul's. Paul's argument here um, 
Verse 31, uh, 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Then he's saying, be imitated of me as I am of Christ. So I think the principle behind this is as Christians, we are not to be living for our own selves. Our, our job as Christians is to be representing Christ to all around us. So if that means I don't get to eat meat at this meal, so be it. I can share Christ with this brother or this friend uh, who is concerned about this thing and encourage their faith and not have my desire for meat keep me from being able to show the kindness of the Lord to them. And I think the same thing, because the principle is for others. And so gluttony is a, is a sin that is literally self-absorbed. Like it, you, you, you were, it's all about the, the self. And so I, I think there's a connection there to where uh, you're not considering others or how you might bless others or benefit others. You are completely self-absorbed. So I don't know. Does that jive? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't I mean, it's a, it's an idolatrous issue, but the idolatry he's talking about here is specifically known false religions that are demons. Uh, well, it's um okay. Go for it. Go for it. Let's finish with this one. They are demons because they're actually looking at the demon table and he's identifying the person as Christian. Therefore, from there you save them or do bad things. And he's saying. Is that commentary at the bottom, or is that the text yeah. itself? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's consistent with what Sarah was saying, too. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Um, Lord, Lord, help us to, uh, first of all, consider the Lord's Supper and, and, and understand its, its, its gravity, uh, how important it was to the Corinthian church, how important it was to Paul, uh, what, is, what is happening at the Lord's Supper as we continue to, to add to our understanding of it. Lord, I pray that next month you would add more to our understanding uh, as, as we begin to look more to, to Christ's teaching in the Gospels. And um, Lord, I pray for unity as a church um, when we take the supper together, that we would all, as, as one body, uh, be remembering our participation in Christ, uh, acknowledging it even, even that very moment. Um, help us to have a a biblically informed understanding of this and, and edify us, Lord. Build us up in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.